This movie deals with measurements. It is intended for viewing before students do an introductory laboratory activity designed to introduce the concepts of accuracy, precision, and experimental errors. Upon completion of the laboratory activity associated with this movie, students will be expected to be able to compare and contrast systematic and random errors, compare and contrast accuracy and precision, assess the accuracy of measurements, assess precision of measurements by calculating and interpreting the standard error and propagating errors, relate the concept of significant figures to experimental precision, properly round off reported measurements based on experimental precision, and properly measure length using a ruler, a veneer caliper, and a micrometer caliper. Accuracy and precision are two ways that we describe the quality of a measurement. People often use the terms precision and accuracy interchangeably. They are, in fact, different. Accuracy refers to the correctness of a measurement, whereas precision refers to its reproducibility. The term error refers to the difference between the measured value and the true value of what is being measured. The extent to which the two values agrees gives us an indication of the accuracy. The typical way we assess the accuracy of our measurement involves calculation of percent error. The percent error is simply the ratio of the error to the true value expressed as a percentage. It is important to realize that the true value of whatever it is we're trying to measure may not always be known. So typically, we would compare our results with those that are available in the literature. The term literature refers to the published works. Generally, we rely on publications by reputable scientists and results that are corroborated by other reputable work. It is possible, for example, that no one has attempted to measure the quantity we are trying to measure. But there might be a reliable accepted theory that predicts what it should be. In this case, we can use the value predicted by the theory, the theoretical value, as our true value. You may ask, what makes a theory reliable or acceptable? This would be a theory whose predictions have been found to be consistent with a wide range of other experimental measurements. For us to get an indication of the precision, we obviously need to do multiple trials. We then apply the methods of statistics to the results of multiple trials to assess the precision. It is important to note that a high precision is necessary for high accuracy. Without precision, you can be accurate, but only out of luck. However, it is possible to be inaccurate even if you are precise. That is, it is possible for you to be consistently wrong. Assessing the accuracy of measurements is something that we should be doing on a routine basis. Here we illustrate how it is done. Suppose you did an experiment where you tried to measure the charge of an electron and found it to be 1.2 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. You do a literature search and found the accepted value to be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. How would you describe the accuracy of your experimental value? To describe the accuracy, we need to determine the percent error, which is just the ratio of the error to the true value. We calculate the error by taking the difference between the measured value, 1.2 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, and the expected value, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. This gives us negative 0.4 times 10 to the minus 19. Others may do the subtraction the other way to get a positive 0.4 times 10 to the minus 19. For convenience, we'll just consider the absolute value. Taking the ratio of the error to the expected value gives us 0.25, or 25% error. Errors associated with measurements can be classified into two types. One type is called systematic or determinant. Systematic errors are those that are avoidable or correctable. They also tend to be one-sided. This means that the results are consistently lower than the true value or consistently higher than the true value. One possible source of systematic error 
is an improperly calibrated instrument. You avoid the error by calibrating it properly. Calibration means using the instrument to make a well-known value or a set of well-known values, then adjusting the instrument's readout to match the known values. If the readout cannot be adjusted, you could determine what to do with the values given by the readout to get the known value. For example, a thermometer might consistently read 1 degree below the correct temperature. So if it reads 20 degrees, you know that the temperature is actually 21 degrees. Another cause of systematic error is poor experimental design. Again, this is correctable. How? Figure out what's causing the error and find a way to account for it. Accuracy of measurements primarily depend on the elimination of systematic errors. Elimination of systematic errors must be given careful consideration by scientific researchers and designers of experiments for laboratory instruction. Students should be more concerned about the other type of errors. It is not possible to completely eliminate experimental errors. Errors due to unavoidable variations associated with a measurement are called random or indeterminate errors. In general, smaller errors are more probable than larger ones. The best we can do to deal with random errors is to do multiple trials and average the results. This is because random errors will tend to average out to zero. Unlike systematic errors, which are one-sided, random errors can lead to measured values that are higher or lower than the true value, with equal probability. We describe the precision of a set of measurements by describing the distribution of the random errors. We do this by applying statistical formulas. Because of random errors, we say that there is an uncertainty associated with any measurement we report. In fact, the word uncertainty is often used interchangeably with the term random error. A smaller uncertainty means better precision. It is standard practice to perform multiple trials of an experiment to minimize random errors. When we report the average or mean of the trials, we can indicate the precision explicitly by quoting what are known as the standard error or standard percent error of the mean, or we can imply the precision by the way we round off the mean. The mean or average value of several trials is easily obtained by adding all the values obtained and dividing by the sum of the number of values added. Symbolically, if x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, and so on are the results from individual trials, then the average x bar is equal to the summation of x sub i from i equals 1 to n divided by n. In this formula, n is the number of trials. Here's an example. Suppose several measurements of the depth of a cup led to the following values 30.36 centimeters, 30.48 centimeters, and 30.57 centimeters. The discrepancies between these numbers could be due to the nature of the cup. It may have different depths at different places. What is the mean depth? To calculate the mean, we add up the values obtained from all the trials. 30.36 plus 30.48 plus 30.57 centimeters equals 91.41 centimeters. Dividing by the number of trials, 3, we get 30.47 centimeters as the mean or average depth. The standard error of the mean is typically used to explicitly quote the uncertainty of the average of several measurements. The standard error of the mean can be calculated from the standard deviation which is the square root of the variance. Let's examine the procedure for calculating these quantities. To calculate the variance, we first calculate the mean. Then we calculate the deviation of each individual value from the mean. We square each deviation, then add them all up. Then we divide the total by n minus 1, where n is the number of trials. The standard deviation is simply the square root of the variance. Let's illustrate this using the following data. We can calculate the mean of these values to be 30.47 centimeters. To get the deviations, we subtract the mean from each individual value. For example, the deviation of the first value, 30.36 centimeters, from the mean, 30.47 centimeters, 
is 30.36 centimeters minus 30.47 centimeters or negative 0.11 centimeters. Similarly, we can calculate the other deviations to be positive 0.01 centimeters and positive 0.10 centimeters. We square each deviation, then add them up. Finally, we divide by n minus 1. n is the number of trials which, in the example we have here, is 3. Therefore, n minus 1 is 2. This gives us a variance of 0.111 centimeters squared. The standard deviation is simply the square root of the variance. In this case, we get 0.333 centimeters. If you need to report standard deviation, it is customary to report up to one digit past the first non-zero digit. If you are using it to calculate the standard error, you should keep an extra digit. In the example here, you would report the standard deviation as 0.33 centimeters. But to avoid round-off errors, which could lead to an overestimation of the uncertainties, keep an extra digit to calculate the standard error of the mean. If you examine the formula for variance, you can see that it is really an attempt to concisely describe how the individual values differ from the average. In fact, we refer to the variance and standard deviations as measures of spread. If we were to repeat our measurements numerous times, we would expect about two-thirds of the results for individual trials to cluster around the mean within one standard deviation. The smaller the deviation, the smaller the spread, the more precise our measurements are. In our example here, we estimate that there is two-thirds chance that the result from a single trial will fall between 30.14 and 30.80 centimeters. 30.14 centimeters is one standard deviation below our mean, and 30.80 centimeters is one standard deviation above our mean. Standard deviation gives us an indication of the reliability of a single measurement. If we want an indication of the precision of the mean of several measurements, we need to calculate the standard deviation of the mean, which is also known as the standard error of the mean. From here on, we will simply refer to it as the standard error, SE. When we report the mean of several trials, we can explicitly indicate its precision by including the standard error, following a plus or minus sign. For example, suppose the average length, L, of something is reported as 30.46 plus or minus 0 0.09 centimeters. 30.46 centimeters is the mean. 0 0.09 centimeters is the standard error. We expect that if we were to do the experiment again, using the same number of trials, there is a two-thirds chance that the average we will get will fall between 30.37 centimeters and 30.55 centimeters. Let's examine the formula for standard error carefully. You will note that it is equal to the standard deviation divided by the square of n. n is the number of trials. Since n is at least 2, we can see that the standard error is always less than the standard deviation. What this means is that we have more confidence in the average value than we do in the result of a single trial. When reporting standard errors, we generally round off to the first non-zero digit. If this digit happens to be 1 or 2, it is customary to round off to the next decimal place. For example, let's say you calculate the standard error and your calculator gives you 0 0.0345. The first non-zero digit is 3. You drop the 4 and 5 and report the standard error as 0 0.03. If you got 0 0.017654, then the first non-zero digit is 1. We round off to the next decimal place, which has a 7. We drop the next digits, 654. The first digit we are dropping is 6, which is larger than 5, so we round up. The mean should be rounded off to as many decimal places as the standard error. We need to add trailing zeros as necessary. Consider the first example given here. No standard error is given as 0.012 meters, so the mean must be reported to the third decimal place. What's wrong with the second example? The standard error should only be reported to the first non-zero digit, or one place past that if the first non-zero digit is 1 or 2. 
Since the first non-zero digit is 6, we drop everything after that. Since the last digit in the properly rounded standard error is in the hundredth place, the mean should be reported with two decimal places. You may have wondered why measurements are sometimes reported with trailing zeros after the decimal point, as in 25.0 or 25.000, when the extra zeros do not really affect the value being reported. In the preceding example, we have seen a glimpse of the reason why. The way a number is rounded off should give us an indication of the level of uncertainty. The last digit of a properly reported measurement tells us the decimal place of the first non-zero digit in the uncertainty. For example, if a measurement is reported as 25.0 centimeters, the last digit reported is in the tenths place. Therefore, we know that the first non-zero digit in the uncertainty is also in the tenths place. This means that the uncertainty is at least plus or minus 0 0.1. It could be plus or minus 0 0.3 or plus or minus 0 0.6 and so on. If a measurement is reported as 25.000 centimeters, the last reported digit is in the thousandth place. Then the uncertainty is at least plus or minus 0 0.001. That is, the first non-zero digit in the uncertainty is also in the thousandth place. What is the implied uncertainty in 4.00 meters? Since the last digit reported is in the hundredth place, then the uncertainty is at least plus or minus 0 0.01. It could be as much as plus or minus 0 0.09. Whenever we follow the proper procedure for reporting measurements, then except for any leading zeros in powers of 10, all the reported digits are said to be significant. In other words, the first significant digit is the first non-zero digit, and the last significant digit gives us an indication of the magnitude of the uncertainty. For example, how would you report 0 0.021023 plus or minus 0 0.0635 cubic centimeters without explicitly quoting the uncertainty? Let's see. The first non-zero digit in the uncertainty is 6. It is in the fourth decimal place. Therefore, the value 0 0.021023 should be reported to the fourth decimal place. In this case, there should only be three significant figures. The first significant figure is the first non-zero digit, 2. The last significant digit is in the fourth decimal place, 0. In other words, the significant digits are 2, 1, and 0. The leading zeros are not significant because their sole purpose is to locate the decimal point, that is, to indicate the magnitude of the reported value. What if a number is reported as 7.30 times 10 to the fifth centimeters? What is the implied uncertainty? The last significant digit is in the second decimal place, 0. Therefore, the uncertainty is at least plus or minus 0 0.01 times 10 to the fifth. It can be as much as plus or minus 0 0.09 times 10 to the fifth. There are three significant figures in the values as reported here. We start counting the first non-zero digit, 7, then go all the way to the end. The significant digits are 7, 3, and 0. Remember that digits in powers of 10, just like leading zeros, are not considered significant. Like leading zeros, their purpose is to indicate the magnitude of the value being reported. If the uncertainty in a value to be reported is larger than plus or minus 1 unit, it is best to use scientific notation to avoid ambiguity. For example, suppose the length of something is found to be 2,300 plus or minus 25 centimeters. Let's look at the uncertainty. It's 25. The first non-zero digit in the uncertainty is 2, which is in the tenths place. Therefore, 2,300 should only be reported to the tenths place. The last significant digit is the zero in the tenths place. 
We need the other zero to locate the decimal point. Our value is 2,300, not 230. So that we don't have to write the second zero, we write 2,300 in scientific notation. The scientific notation is 2.30 times 10 to the third. Suppose you were asked which is more precise, 50 plus or minus 0 0.5 or 5,000 plus or minus 0 0.5. The standard errors are the same. In both cases, it's 0 0.5 centimeters. Yet intuitively, we know that an error of 0 0.5 centimeters does not have as much of an effect on 5,000 centimeters as it does on 50 centimeters. Just like it's better to assess accuracy by expressing the error as a percentage of the true value, it's better to assess precision by expressing the standard error as a percentage of the average value. Let's do it for the examples we have here. In 50 plus or minus 0.5 centimeters, the standard percent error is equal to the standard error, 0.5, divided by the average value, 50, which is equal to 0.01, or 1%. Instead of saying the length L is 50 plus or minus 0.5 centimeters, you can also say that it is 50 centimeters plus or minus 1%. Simply, we can show that 5,000 plus or minus 0.5 centimeters is equivalent to 5,000 centimeters plus or minus 0.01%. The standard error is sometimes referred to as the absolute uncertainty, or absolute measure of precision. The standard percent error is sometimes referred to as a relative uncertainty, or a relative measure of precision. It is preferably used when you want to make comparisons. Whenever we do calculations using numbers that have uncertainties, how do we round off the answer? We round it off to reflect the magnitude of uncertainties in the values we used in the calculation. We call the process of determining the uncertainty in the result as propagation of errors, or propagation of uncertainties. For addition and subtraction, it is found that the square of the standard error in the result is equal to the sum of the squares of the standard errors in the terms added or subtracted. For example, if x is obtained from adding a and b, then the square of the standard error in x is equal to the square of the standard error in a plus the square and the standard error of b. Here's a simple example. Suppose you want to add lengths of 25 and 15 centimeters where the uncertainties are 0.12 and 0.05 centimeters. The sum of 25 and 15 is 40. The sum of the squares of the standard errors, 0.12 squared plus 0.05 squared is 0.0169. This is the square of the standard error of the result. The square root of 0 0.0169 is 0 0.13. Therefore, the result is 40 plus or minus 0 0.13 centimeters. When we are multiplying or dividing, we can propagate uncertainties using the rule that the square in the relative uncertainty in the result is equal to the sum of the square of the relative uncertainty in the factors. Here's a simple example. Suppose the length and width of a rectangle are 25 and 15 centimeters and the standard errors in the lengths are 0.12 and 0.05 centimeters, respectively. What is the uncertainty in the area? Area is the length times width. 25 times 15 equals 375 square centimeters. The question is, what is the uncertainty in 375? The standard percent error in the length is 0.12 divided by 25. We square this. The standard percent error in the width is 0.05 divided by 15. We square this as well. We add the squares of the standard percent error and get 3.415 times 10 to the minus 5. This sum is equal to the square of the standard percent error in the area. Taking the square root, we get 0.0058 or 0.58% as the relative uncertainty in the area. To the absolute uncertainty, or the standard error, we take 0.58% of the area, which is 375 square centimeters. This gives us an absolute uncertainty, or standard error, of 2.1 square centimeters. Note that since the first non-zero digit in the standard error is 2, 
we keep an extra digit. Thus, we can say that the area is 375 square centimeters, plus or minus 0.58%, or 375 plus or minus 2.1 square centimeters. Here's an example illustrating how to propagate errors when it is not just addition or subtraction that's involved. Here we have to do a multiplication after we add. What is the parameter of a rectangle of length 25 plus or minus 0.12 centimeters and width 15 plus or minus 0.05 centimeters? The parameter is twice the sum of the length and width. First we add L and W. We get 40 centimeters plus or minus 0.13 centimeters. The standard error can be obtained by following the rule for addition. Since we have to multiply L plus W by 2, to get the parameter P, we apply the rules for multiplication and division to get the standard percent error in P. Note that the number 2 in the formula is an exact number by definition. It has no uncertainty, so its standard error is 0 and the standard percent error is also 0. Here's another example showing how to propagate errors when all you are doing is multiplying or dividing. The calculation deals with determining the volume of a cylinder for measurements of diameter D and height H. Why do you think the standard percent error of the diameter D appears twice in the formula for propagation of errors? The reason is that it is squared in the formula for volume. Since D squared is simply D times D, D essentially appears as a factor twice. You will note that pi and 4 do not appear in the formula. They should, but they are not shown since they are exact numbers by definition. There are no uncertainties associated with these numbers. Their standard errors and standard percent errors are all zero. The formulas for propagation of uncertainties is derived from calculus. If z is calculated from a, b, and so on, the general formula for the square of the standard error in Z can be thought of as being the sum of contributions from A, B, and so on. The contribution from A is equal to the partial derivative of Z with respect to A, the standard error in A. Similarly, the contribution from B is equal to the partial derivative of Z with respect to B times the standard error in B. Propagation of errors can be cumbersome and is often only done in formal reports where a thorough error analysis is necessary. For most calculations, we follow simpler rules for rounding off answers. These rules are generally, not always, consistent with results obtained by propagating errors. For addition, the rule is simple. Round off to as many decimal places as the least precise term. The least precise term is the one with the largest absolute uncertainty. In the example shown here, the uncertainty in 125 is at least plus or minus 0 0.1. The uncertainty in 2.00 is at least plus or minus 0 0.01. 125 is the least precise term, so the sum is rounded off to the nearest tenth, that is, to the same number of decimal places as 125. For multiplication or division, the rule is to round off as many significant figures as the least precise term. The least precise term is the one with fewest significant figures. In the example shown here, 125 has four significant figures. 2 to 0 has three. Therefore, the answer is to be reported as three significant figures. Numbers that are defined to be exact do not have any uncertainty at all. We can therefore think of these numbers as perfectly precise. When used in a calculation, you should consider these numbers as having infinite number of significant figures. Consider the calculation shown here, where a measurement in millimeters is converted into centimeters. By definition, one centimeter is exactly equal to 10 millimeters. Therefore, the numbers 1 and 10 as used in this calculation are exact. Both of these numbers are considered as having an infinite number of significant figures. Since the measurement in millimeters is 1.252, which is four significant figures, and the other factor in this calculation have an infinite number of significant figures, 
our rule for rounding says that we should round off the answer to four significant figures. In general, numbers with conversion factors are exact by definition. Therefore, unit conversions generally lead to a result with the same number of significant figures. Whenever we're doing multi-step calculations, we should keep an extra significant figure in the intermediate results in order to avoid overestimating the uncertainty in the results due to round-off errors. So far, we have learned how to report the average of measurements based on the standard error. But what about individual measurements? How should we report them? They should reflect what is known as the precision of the instrument used. Precision of the instrument refers to the fineness of the scale or the sensitivity of the instrument. In general, the uncertainty is approximately one-tenth of the difference in the readings for adjacent marks. For example, if adjacent marks on a scale are 0.1 centimeters apart, as in the example shown here, the uncertainty is approximately one-tenth of 0.1 or 0.01. We should report measurements from this scale to the second decimal place. The right edge appears to be around 3.23 or 3.24, and the left edge appears to be around 2.50. The difference is 0.74 or 0.73. Note that we kind of have to guess whether the last digit is a 4 or a 3. The precision or reproducibility of measurements depends on natural variations and the quantity being measured. But it is also important to realize that it depends on the sensitivity or precision of the instrument being used. Consider the example shown here. Let's say you wanted to measure the variations in the diameter of a collection of beads. Suppose you used a micrometer caliper and found the diameter of four beads to be 5.01, 5.02, 4.97 and 4.99 millimeters. In this case, you will find the standard error to be 0.011 millimeters. But if you used a ruler where the adjacent marks are 1 millimeter apart, you would have gotten 5 millimeters for each of the beads. Obviously, in this case, you will find that the standard error is 0. Does this mean that the measurement with a ruler is more precise? The answer is no. It is clear that the ruler, at best, can only detect differences in lengths of 0.1 millimeters. In other words, the natural variations and the quantity being measured in this example is not detectable by the ruler. In other words, if you get a standard error of zero, you should not immediately interpret it to mean perfect precision. You should be alert to the possibility that the instrument is not sensitive enough to allow you to determine the true standard error. A veneer scale facilitates the determination of the last significant digit from an analog scale. The veneer scale slides across the main scale. The distance between adjacent marks on the veneer scale are only 90% of the distance between adjacent marks on the main scale. The readings on the main scale correspond to where the zero mark on the veneer scale falls. In the example shown below, the zero mark of the veneer scale falls between the 22 and 23 mark on the main scale. Therefore, the reading is 22 point something. That something is determined by examining the veneer scale. It corresponds to the veneer mark that lines up best with the mark on the main scale. In the example shown here, the 6 mark on the veneer scale lines up best with the 28 mark on the main scale. Therefore, the reading from this scale is 22.6. Read the following scales. For the picture on the left, the zero mark falls between 23 and 24, so the reading is 23 point something. The fourth mark on the veneer lines up well with the 27 mark on the main scale. Therefore, the reading is 23.4. For the picture on the right, the correct reading is 3.60. A micrometer scale is even better than a veneer scale at facilitating the precise determination of the last significant digits. A micrometer scale consists of a thimble which recedes or advances across the main scale as it is turned. To read a micrometer scale, you need to determine how many adjacent marks on the main scale is traversed by making one full turn of the thimble. 
Read the main scale at the edge of the thimble and read the mark on the thimble that lines up with the main scale. In the example here, adjacent marks on the main scale are 0.5 units apart and adjacent marks are traversed by making one full turn of the thimble which is divided into 50 divisions. 0.5 divided by 50 is 0.01. Therefore, adjacent marks on the thimble are 0.01 units apart. The edge of the thimble is almost one full turn past the 6.5 mark on the main scale. The reading on the thimble is 47.5. Therefore, the reading is 6.5 plus 47.5 times 0.01 or 6.975. Here's a picture of all the materials you will need for this experiment. You will need a wooden block, a cylindrical cup, and a small metallic cylinder. The measuring devices you will use are a veneer caliper, a micrometer caliper, and a ruler. A veneer caliper is used for measuring lengths. It is designed to make it convenient to measure different types of objects. Use the outer jaws if the length to be measured can be clamped between the jaws. Use the inner jaws to measure gaps, such as the inner diameter of a cylindrical cup. The veneer caliper can also be used to measure depths such as the inner height of a cub as shown here. A micrometer caliper can be used to measure lengths that can be clamped between its jaws. When clamping the object to be measured, turn the ratchet at the tip of the barrel or thimble to avoid damaging the micrometer caliper. You should stop turning the ratchet when you hear a click. Here's an overview of the experiment you will be doing in the lab. In part one, you will measure the length, width, and thickness of a wooden block using a ruler. Do five trials. Do each trial at different locations in the block. You will repeat the same procedure using a veneer caliper in part two. Make sure that when the outer jaws of the caliper are touching, the reading is in fact zero. If not, you need to record the reading and subtract it from all readings you make with the caliper. In part three, you will determine the inner volume of a cylindrical cup by using the veneer caliper's depth gauge to measure the height and the inside jaws to measure the inner diameter. In part four, you will measure the diameter and height of a small metal cylinder using a micrometer caliper. The measurements you make in the lab will allow you to practice applying the concepts taught in this movie. For the wooden block, calculate mean length, width, and thickness of a wooden block. Account for the systematic error by subtracting the zero reading of the veneer caliper. Calculate the standard error and the standard percent error of the length, width, and thickness of the wooden block. Calculate volume of the wooden block as well as the standard percent error and standard error of the volume. Calculate the percent difference between the results for the veneer caliper and the ruler. For the cylindrical cup, calculate mean diameter and depth of the cylindrical cup. Account for a systematic error by subtracting the zero reading of the veneer caliper. Calculate the standard error and the standard percent error of the inner diameter and depth of the cup. Calculate the volume of the cup as well as the standard percent error and standard error of the volume. For the metal cylinder, calculate mean diameter and length of the metal cylinder. Account for a systematic error by subtracting the zero reading of the micrometer caliper. Calculate the standard error and standard percent error of the diameter and length. Calculate the volume as well as the standard percent error and standard error of the volume. 